Welcome, friends in podcast land. This is Mark. We are speaking on spirits tonight, and tonight we are going to be talking about shapeshifters. We've got the whole gang here. We're going to be going over everything dealing with shapeshifters, covering the history, different cultures, and everything. So sit back, relax, join us as we transform and talk about shapeshifters. Welcome. Welcome. Glad you could join us for this podcast. Again, we are here today. We're talking about shapeshifters. The interesting thing about shapeshifters, they have been known throughout history, all different cultures, all around the world. Just a brief uh, list of some of the places where we have had shapeshifter lore come from. We have shapeshifter lore from India, the Philippines, Tatar, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Somali, South Africa, Trinidad and Tobago, Argentina and Chile all have. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. They all have some level of shapeshifter lore, history, culture involved in their mythology. They have similar characteristics too. And they all have similar. That's the interesting thing is that um, all the shapeshifter lore have similar characteristics. So before we go any farther, what is a shapeshifter? What are we talking about? Well, one of the definitions is that a shapeshifter is an entity that has the ability to physically transform through an inherently superhuman ability, divine intervention, demonic manipulation, sorcery, spells, or having inherited uh, the ability. So a shapeshifter is uh, an entity that transforms into, well, pretty much another being. Uh, Probably the most common one that most people are familiar with, uh, would be the idea of the werewolf. Somebody who starts out as a human and then transforms into a wolf or canine-like creature. Uh, That would be a shapeshifter. Um, That's one of the versions of shapeshifter, but that gives you an idea of what we're talking about, is actually changing into another type of being. Uh, To a lesser extent, uh, maybe as popularity or being considered a shapeshifter, the lore of the vampire, where the vampire would turn into a bat to escape, uh, is another version of a shapeshifter. So, but we've got a lots of different versions of shapeshifters. We've got a lot of history to go through, a lot of different cultures we can talk about. So we're going to get started into that. So, Yeah, Mark, you were speaking about the werewolves, and I found it interesting. I was researching the Celtic side of the things, and uh, there's actually a village in Ireland that the whole village allegedly could change into the wolf, right? Like, what is that, lycanthropy? Lycanthropy, yes. Right, and so they had, um, and they would change off. So it was a seven-year job assignment. (laughs) (laughs) And certain people within the village could change into the wolf, would change into the wolf, and they would hunt animals and, you know, domestic and, and wild animals. If they didn't get hurt, during their seven-year stint when they had changed into a wolf, they would come back to human form. So they were like wolf the whole time. They would come back to human form, and then somebody else in the village had their seven-year stint. I thought that was kind of interesting. And this was recorded in, you know, several thousand years ago. And it was just part of the whole village. So... Yeah, I'm beginning to wonder if American Werewolf in London story came from maybe somebody reading about that whole village. 
It's so. Shakespearean, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's got a Shakespearean flavor to it, yeah, for sure. I yeah. yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. So, I was amazed with the Native American one. Uh, it listed everything, but it seemed that the Navajo uh, used it as kind of a power play um, for curses, if you will. So if you did ill to someone, they would curse you and you would become a skinwalker or, or, or whatever it might be. So they weren't doing it. They're cursing someone else. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yep. Huh. Carrie, what did you find out? Did you have any? Well, I, when I was going into the Spanish side of it or whatever, it, it took me back to the Navajo. Oh. I mean, that there's it all is based back to that part of it. And... But yeah, they the origin, original or whatever, they considered it a medicine man or somebody who had achieved their highest level. But then they had to do something very horrible like kill immediate family. Because that was their power, was to use it for bad. So the person who was the shapeshifter mm-hmm. had to kill immediate family. Interesting. Yeah, they had made it to the highest level of priesthood or whatever you want to call it. But they also don't talk about it. The Navajos don't. They, they, it's bad juju to talk about it or speak of it or they think it brings bad things on them or their village or... That's mm. what I ran into too. And it, taboo. It, yeah, you don't talk about it. This is not something that they even appreciate us talking about at all. Hmm. Well, a lot of the... Uh, what little I ran across about the Navajo tradition or Native American tradition is that the skinwalker is generally a name that was given to... Um, a medicine man or a spiritual person that had gone bad, that had for whatever right. reason used their powers for for evil so instead of good like instead of healing. Man? Yeah. Okay. So, Interesting. so somebody who had the powers of a medicine man, and that was their their great spiritual, you know, their spiritual leaders, um, for the different tribes. And then, but if they started using their powers for negative reasons, for dark reasons then that's when they went down the path of becoming a skinwalker. And allowed here, well, here in the United States, I think a skinwalker is one of the most popular current versions of shapeshifters we have. Yeah. When we talk shapeshifters, I think skinwalker, uh, for anybody who studies the paranormal, that's probably the first one that, that comes to mind. It's a scary name. It is. It is. It yeah. is. So that's one of the most popular ones that we have around here now when we're talking about shapeshifters. Um they do go to the skinwalkers, and that's part of the, again, going back a little bit to the werewolf. Um, I've heard a lot of stories where they will take type of a canine uh, type of form. So. Yeah, this particular village I was talking about in Ireland, it's, um, that there's some stuff written about it called the Werewolves of Oser- Osery, and it's this whole clan within this village, and they do the seven-year hitches. But what I didn't realize when I was doing some of the research on this stuff, it wasn't just, you know, werewolves, but how many of the Celtic legends people turn into cats, goats, dogs. I mean, it's not just the wolf. It's all kinds of things. And I don't know that there's anything that's like, I would like want to be an eagle or something really cool, you know, so I could fly over everybody. But uh, knowing me, I'd have fleas and I'd be... A dog. But uh, I, I thought it was pretty neat that, and I hadn't even heard of some of the uh, of the terms that they'd used. But it is in every, every, led, every culture before they communicated with each other, right? So where's legend break in reality? I mean, how can you have the same legends on different continents when they really didn't have... The ability to communicate they had trade but right it's fascinating it is because a lot of these cultures well they're separated by time and distance mm-hmm. so far that there's no way they could have communicated right and uh, some of the earliest known that i come across is greek mythology it goes way back to zeus and this is where the uh, lycanthropy came from with the werewolves king lycan zeus turned his family into a canine type I didn't know that. Dogs, yeah. Interesting. So it's been around, you know, that long. But then again, a lot of these 
when you're talking the history of the world, you know, how many people had access to Greek mythology, you know, how many of these different cultures had access to this information that they could have developed their own, yeah. you know, cultures from. So even though Greek mythology has been around, well, probably almost forever, a lot of these cultures didn't have access to it. I mean, the history of humanoids on the planet, it's been relatively recently since reading was a common, right. you know, a common thing. So you got to ask how many, you know, would have known about these. But And then the Asian cultures that have it, the Central and South American cultures that have shapeshifter lore, Celtic cultures, you know, these are far removed from ancient Greece. Yeah, you were talking earlier about an, an Egyptian goddess. Mark? An Egyptian goddess. One of my interesting things, I ran across an Egyptian goddess, and I, took, I chose Egyptian because... Um, as you know, I'm a demonologist, and when you study demonology, you're not into that very long before you end up in Sumeria, which is area we now know as the Middle East, and Egypt. A lot of your research takes you back to these two cultures. So I took the Egyptian one because I was uh, kind of interested in what that is. And interestingly enough, there was not a whole lot in the uh, Egyptian on the shapeshifter itself. But I did run across what they considered a shapeshifter was the goddess Hathor. Uh, H-A-T-H-O-R is how you spell that. And she was a goddess. Um, Hathor is kind of fun. Um, kind of a fun... Fun of parties. Fun of parties. She actually is. She is She is a party goddess, you know. Uh, give me one second here. Let me go through my notes, see what I can come up with. Yeah. There's a... Uh, I went to print out my uh, notes before this and my printer died, so I had to send it to myself. So I'm trying to look up my notes here and see what I can find. Um, Hathor is a very feminine goddess, works with very feminine energy. Uh, she is a goddess over joy, love, dance, alcohol, and perfume. She's a party goddess. She is. She is totally a <laughs> party goddess. Real. In fact, to this day, uh, when they celebrate her right around July 20th, um, beer and wine are encouraged at oh, the ceremony. So she's coming to my next she, party. She, <laughs> That's it. She's all right. I read pretty, people pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So has her. She's she's fun to have her around. So, um, but she is a couple interesting things. She can manifest various different animals depending on her mood. Uh, she could appear as a cat, falcon. Actually, as a fig tree, a vulture, hippopotamus, and a cobra. Those are some really random animals. Those are some really random. I but mean, I, I guess she, if she was really upset with you, she will show up as a lioness. Oh, or a cobra. So if, yeah, yeah. yeah. a cobra, cobra can't be really friendly either. No, but that's I mean, kind of... <laughs> they're not fuzzy and warm and cute. No. I hear tail hippos kill most people in Africa. That's true. That's true. And hippos have got, yeah. They have a really negative personality. Mm -hmm. They, yeah, so. Um, but her main, uh, Hathor is actually, her main thing is to help um, babies. She arrives when a baby's, and the shapeshifter part of the lore comes in when they come up with the theory of seven Hathors in that there are seven different versions of Hathor that will appear when a baby is born. Interesting. And so now there's some, going through it now, there's some discussion. Is it Hathor in seven different versions or did she have assistance? Oh. Uh, you know, but for some reason, seven. Now, again, interestingly, I'm just going to throw this out here. If you have studied the paranormal for any time at all, seven is a very interesting number. It keeps showing up again. They've got the seven Hathors. As you were speaking earlier about the seven years, yep. people were the yep. wolves. The number seven just keeps showing up over and over again. And do that. So uh, they would actually appear at the birth of a baby and pronounce the baby's destiny. Interesting. So, and then they would, the mothers uh, would offer seven red ri ribbons, one for each Hathor. So. Hmm. Well, that's interesting that you have an, uh, an Egyptian goddess that was a shapeshifter because there's a Celtic goddess that was a shape. Uh, say that 
shapeshifter. Shifter. Yeah. Um, Morgan, she was considered a shapeshifter. And she was, um, the name Morgan means the Phantom Queen. And she's, uh, as a goddess from old Ireland, was associated with war, destiny, fate, and death. And she frequently turned into a black crow. Uh, which was an ominous sign for those who were preparing to go into battle for against her, because she, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, legend have it has it that Morgan was in fact a triad of sisters, and I cannot pronounce any of their names <laughs> because they're all Gaelic, and you know, that's not happening. So, uh, but she also would turn into um, an eel. She turned into an eel. Really? To, into cattle, wolves. Um, so there was, she did a lot of different things. Um, she was also, she would trick people. And um, she was, yeah, didn't sound like she was a real warm and fuzzy gal to have around at your party. But, uh, so that's interesting. What have you found, Tim? Well, I found that Native Americans like to remain mum on the subject. But I found this. It said, uh, in Navajo thinking, all good things in life result from respect for the harmony of the universe, known as Hazho. An orderly balance governs the actions and thoughts of all living things. Like any other ideal state, this can be difficult to maintain, whether conscious or unconscious, or the result of a skinwalker. A transgressor can result in illness, misfortune, or even disaster, and can be remedied only with a prescribed ceremony to the offended deity. Unlike Western medicine, Navajo cures are targeted at body, mind, and spirit, calling on the patient and divine people to restore his harmony with the world. So, in my looking at the traditions and things, it seems that bad association, bad juju, if you will, is just about always attributed to some sort of shapeshifter or skinwalker. And you have to go to a good medicine man to figure out how to find or how to fight it. And then they do whatever ceremony that they need to do to cure the person of their bad juju. And that's why it's really hard to have Native Americans talk about it. Uh, I work in a barbecue trailer because that's what all the cool people do. <laughs> and <clears throat> we had uh, an elder, a Native American elder, come this week. And I said, hey, I have a question for you. What, what do you think of shapeshifters or the Native mm -hmm. American lore of the shapeshifter skinwalker, if you will? And he looked at me and he said, if you knew, you wouldn't ask. And he grabbed a sandwich and... He walked back to his truck. <laughs> so, I, I guess I don't want to know. So, you know, we hmm. have, for those people that are listening in podcast land, we have a, a local reservation, which is the Shoshone and Bannock tribes. And there's a couple of things that happen out on the reservation. And um, I know people who have seen one of these things and uh the three people that that i'm thinking about that have witnessed this large shape-shifting being um are um uh, i can't say what they do but i can say that they they spend their whole summer outdoors they they hunt they fish they do everything outdoors they're not people who are afraid of the natural environment and they have all three witnessed this thing at different times on the reservation and it has scared them so badly that one guy in particular in, uh, instead of he would cut through the reservation to go to the Blackfoot River to like a family cabin um, he would go all the way around to Soda Springs for years he wouldn't cut through the reservation again it freaked him out so badly the other two people uh, they won't go out on the reservation at all. So, you know. Well, I, I believe him. Yeah. And he gave that, I, I don't know 
that authoritative mm-hmm. period on it. So I right. decided not to ask any more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, somebody's got to be saying something because we have articles that we can read. But to drive around to Soda Springs and avoid the reservation is over a 100 mile trip. Yes. Yeah, that's kind of like way out of your I mean, way. Way out of the it's, way. It's, yes. It's when not like you can it's just... cut through the reservation and get to this place pretty quickly. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I've been on the reservation a lot. And um, uh, there's there's things. Mm-hmm. There's things out there. It's all I can. Oh, they got some fun stuff out there for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, what is it about? You know, uh, there's there's another thing, and it reminds me of the second bean that's on the reservation. Um, in Ireland, right? You all hear about uh, the uh, the little people. Mm-hmm. Now, when my grandpa was drinking the whiskey pretty heavy, he would be convinced we had the little people out in the Manzanita bushes, right? Well, one night I get, he convinced me I saw it too. I really, to this day, I swear I saw this little thing. I don't know. I was too young to be hit in the whiskey, but who knows? Anyway. <laughs> but they have this thing, and it's, it's, um, it's a fairy called the puka. And it is uh, not a nice little creature to have around in your life. It is um, mischievous. It uh, tramples crops, terrifies livestock. Um, so like your hens wouldn't lay eggs and your cows would stop giving milk if they interacted with it. Um, it's not, and it's a shapeshifter, but it's, it's a really menacing thing. And from what it sounds like in, in all these different lore that we have, it's not um, a wonderful thing to come upon. So you're either cursed with it, or you're seeing somebody who was cursed, or you're seeing uh, it could affect you. Mm-hmm. So it's not... So is it a matter of, like, um, not to get religious on people, but you know how in religion, a lot of different types of religion, they will guilt you into being a good person, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Right? Is yeah. this coming from that... Com- that control mechanism that maybe elders want to have over their communities? I don't know. I mean, why would you turn into a werewolf? Because that seems so... I mean, this was, you know, in 1100 BC, right, right. this village was turning into werewolves and it was documented. So I don't feel like that's control, but I don't know. Or is it just the fear that you could turn into a werewolf, the control mechanism? to be a good person. Well, that's a great topic. And one of the questions about a lot of this type of uh, folklore and stories, is this something that was created, again, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago, to keep people in the village at night? Oh, like the movie. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, let's, let's keep people from Wondering leaving. Away. Let's keep people together safe together so let's create stories that will keep them in the community oh that's right control it's a control so is it a form of control well i don't think you can totally rule that out no i mean i don't know that any one of us have ever seen something shapeshift Mm -hmm. maybe we have i don't know not if you were recreationally Partying, right? Maybe you have. I don't right. know. I I'm not recommending that out there, okay? Yeah. I'm just saying. Um, but is that, uh, I have to believe that in every legend there is somewhere a seed of the truth. Well, yes, but on the other hand, um, like having kids, mm-hmm. there's the whole truth. <laughs> <laughs> There's the truth that you have to say to get you out of. (laughs) There's a section of the truth (laughs) that we're going to go with. (laughs) We're going to focus on that section so we don't focus on this other section. And I think that over the millions of years, that section of truth widens and all of a sudden you have werewolves. Mm -hmm. Instead of there's a dog out there. A pack of wolves gonna eat the kids. Yeah, but why would? I, okay, I get that. Uh, I don't have kids, but I have animals. It's a close second. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I'm I'm like, 
why why would all of these different cultures have lycanthropy in it? What, how did that come to pass? Right, when there was no communication When there wasn't between, communication. It's right. not like these ships no... were docking in these different ports all around mm-hmm. the world and going, hey, did you know Bob turned into a werewolf? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're just trading goods. I don't think they were getting together to... Mm-hmm. Maybe they did. I don't know. But they didn't even speak the same languages. Right. So how did that... And, the, and, and in the Gaelic communities, they didn't write things down very much. It was all passed down verbally. So there isn't a lot of written documentation, right. very little, in any of the Celtic world. So, mm-hmm. were there werewolves? I mean, real? I, I don't... Well, if you're talking about shapeshifters, it covers a lot of different animals, not sure. just werewolves. Yeah, no, right. Throughout different cultures. Um, you mentioned the uh, crow earlier. Yeah. Crow was very big in shapeshifting lore for um, Nordic mythology. Right. Uh, crows were very important there. And so that was one of the animals that was mentioned in the shape-shifting lore. Yeah. Um, and uh, as getting into a little bit of the uh, darker side towards the demonology stuff, um, the crows are considered messengers. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody will have pet crows and the crows will fly over and see what's happening and report back. Or sometimes the um, magician can see from the crows uh, through the crow's eyes. So crows have been used throughout history as a animal mentioned in shape shifting, right? And different things like that. So I think this the legend of the shape shifter comes from all different cultures, but I think the specific animal changes depending on where you were. Um, Northern Europe and that probably came uh, a lot more for the werewolves. Um, but I think a, a lot of them, we've also seen cobras mentioned. Mm. Um, so, and there's a few, even though it seems like the majority of shapeshifters are negative, there's a few of them that have been positive. There's a few, uh, cultures and traditions where somebody will do shapeshifter for a positive reason to help somebody, to assist a person, to do like that. Now they're very rare compared to the overall story. But there are shapeshifters in both directions, even though the vast majority of them tend to be more negative. So that's why, we're, you know, I got to wonder, is a lot of this shapeshifter lore something that was designed to, again, you know, many, many years ago, keep people in the village? Yeah. In the group, you know, whatever group that is, keep people from wandering through the forest in the middle of the night type of thing. Yeah, and <clears throat> substance, as we kind of mentioned, I think has a lot to do with things too. Right. <laughs> substance has been around for a long time. Whatever you want to Between call it. Between the alcohol and the peyote and everything mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it was kind of interesting. I got When I was going through some of the Celtic stuff, there was, there was a website that brings up... Uh, other shapeshifters from other. So there's, and I'm sure you guys have heard of this one, is the Wendigo. Mm, yes. Sir, Wendigo. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's a mythological evil spirit from the Algonquin tribes of eastern Canada. Mm-hmm. And it's believed that the entity can possess and control humans, forcing them to commit murder and sometimes cannibalism. And as it became more widely known, it's an influenced even the naming of a modern controversial syndrome known as the Wendigo psychosis. And psychiatrists use this term to describe individuals who both fear they will become cannibals and for those who actually admit to craving human flesh. Fascinating. Uh, and like you said, mm-hmm. Philippines, there's mm-hmm. Oswang from the Philippines. The dreaded Oswang is very evil very adaptable shapeshifter. It can assume the shape of a bat, a black boar, a black cat, and a large black dog. Now that's interesting because in a lot of paranormal places that have a lot of a menacing type of paranormal activity, the black dog is seen. And we've had cases, Mark, where Mm -hmm. the family has said they've seen a black dog in their home or on their property. The black dog Mm -hmm. is a really menacing uh, entity. Entity, yeah, yeah, very. 
Um, so this Oswang is likes to emerge at night and stalk any humans it can find. Other shapeshifters in the Philippines um, called the oh got me on the name Capri or Tick Balong also exist in Filipino culture. Um, these shapeshifters are known for their attempts at wooding young, attractive females. Oh, wooding? Must be wooing. That's a typo, guys. Um, wooing young... Maybe, maybe not. I, maybe not. Maybe not. We'll, we'll not go down that path. Well, that's a different type <laughs> of entity. We'll come topic. back to that. <laughs> um, they like uh, young, attractive females who have yet to be married. So, And then there's the monkey wife in the Philippines. It's... Uh, I'm not even going to try it with this one, but it's the monkey wife. It's a bearded woman who was lured out by one of these malicious shapeshifters. Sounds like somebody in the circus. I don't know. But anyway, mm -hmm. she's turned into a monkey against her will and will remain a monkey until the end of her days unless she finds a handsome young man make as a monkey, makes him fall in love with her as a monkey, mm -hmm. and then offers his hand in marriage. Again, as a monkey, mm -hmm. don't think that's happening. But you never know. People do wed ghosts now. Uh, yeah, so, so I've anyway. heard stranger. It's possible now. Yeah. Oh, no, I have not heard that one. No? No. <laughs> what, the wedding of ghosts? Oh, no, there's been... It's been going on for a few years now. Actually, one lady actually got a divorce from her ghost, too. You have to remember, I've lived in the middle of nowhere. I've had a lot of... <laughs> so. Wow. There's Japanese shapeshifters. Mm -hmm. um, See, and one of the ones, the Chinese, um, the nine-tailed fox, which is actually the reverse, the fox can shift into a human. Oh. And normally it's a female. And they can have up to nine tails. And about every hundred years they get a tail. And once they've got the nine tails, they're about 900 years old, and they turn white or golden white. Hmm. But is that just where the, the term reverse. foxy lady comes from? I don't know, but the nine-tailed <laughs> fox is very, uh, they call it a kins kinsu? Interesting. Kitsun. Kitsun. It's a Japanese fox spirit, but it's it's like the reverse. Oh, here I mean, it is. We're talking about humans mm -hmm. turning into animals. This is the fox actually turns into a human. But so she's not... Because it says here that she can rip out, she'll rip out a man's heart. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Now that's <laughs> right. right. That not. theory, though, does exist a lost across a lot of cultures where an animal will turn into a human. Right. Most times, a attractive female to lure a male to his death. Right. Well, mermaids. Right? Yeah, mermaids. That's yeah. yeah. So, uh -huh. mermaids, and uh, again, going clear back to the Iliad, the sirens. Right. That's what they. You, you know, know back so the the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that that idea again covers a lot of different cultures. But I just I found that so. fascinating that that was and that was clear back in the let's see what is it the Han Dynasty. Hmm. So it was a couple of years back. Just uh, yes yeah, is yeah. But it was kind of the reverse of what I was trying to find. Mm -hmm. So, so that is one of the um, one of the biggest. Well, you know, from a demon as a demonologist, you study, and when you get into shapeshifters, it's like, um, according to some people, every shapeshifter is a demon, and just about every demon is a shapeshifter, which is not quite accurate. So, it's in the world of demonology, it's hard to narrow it down. Because everybody comes up to, and I think a lot of, as we were mentioning earlier, anytime anybody has been around a shapeshifter, it does have a very dark energy to it. There's something about it. It's very negative, very dark. It upsets a lot of people. Um, so it just automatically gets classified as a demon. Right. So, you know, we get a lot of cases that get called into us, right? Mm -hmm. and, and for people who don't know, this we're Speaking of Spirits podcast is done by Pocatello Paranormal Research. So, and we get a lot of cases called into us, and we don't take every case. We're pretty selective. But it's amazing to me how many people think they have a demon. And that's super, super, super rare. I can just say it's super rare. We've had negative entities, negative haunts. 
but the whole demon thing. Mm -hmm. I can only remember the one case, Mark. Yeah. The one case that we had, um, and it plagued a family. Mm -hmm. And this thing would mimic a little girl. Yes. So, shape-shifting, little girl. It, it, was, it was not friendly. It was not friendly at all, and it took a lot of work. And I don't think the family will ever be rid of this thing. So, yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely some some dark stuff out there for sure. In fact, I'm going to do a, one of my podcasts soon will be on, it's not a demon, but that's another story for another day. We'll come back to that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, some of the, it, it, there's this, um, one type of shape shifting that seems common across multiple course, cultures is the belief systems that the dead can assume the shape of an animal. So it doesn't have to be just a living person. Hmm. And I thought that was interesting because I don't know. They say that this is a common belief system. I've, I've never heard of that, where the dead come back and take the form of. I have had my animals who have died come back to me. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I've reached down to pet a dog that I had put down two days before because I felt his familiar lean against me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but so they're saying that the belief system that the dead can assume the shape of an animal, sometimes in order to simply visit their loved ones, but often in an attempt to get revenge on those who killed them. Uh, interesting concept. Mm -hmm. So uh, they seem to think this is common. I don't, I've never heard of that. Well, again, if you go back, you know, a few years, that could be a fairly common, if somebody passed away and then, you know, they're close family saw an animal somehow doing something maybe slightly different well that's true like right after my mom passed um I, there was dragonflies everywhere in the yard yeah like that day just seeing <laughs> that's my connection to my daughter in yeah. fact she had dragonfly i mean that is my connection to her that was her and i's connection when she was here mm -hmm. and so yeah it it it's amazing how they do show up on days that you like you almost need them. need them. You need them yeah. to be there, and all, and of, a sudden all there. of a sudden they're yeah there. Yeah. So I do believe that that does happen with people, or butterflies, or different types of birds, or right things like that. I something do believe that, they that they're that's yeah. how and, they're letting you know. And a lot of times, maybe it'll be something not normal. You know, like seeing a butterfly maybe in very early spring. Mm -hmm. You know, when it's not a normal time to see them. Right. Out of character. Yeah. So something out of character. So I can see where a legend like that could come from. Oh, that's amazing what animals are, too. They have senses, too. Uh, just kind of a third-party perspective, if you will. I worked at a funeral home for a while when I was a teenager. And I'm pretty good with dogs. I like dogs a lot, usually. Good. Dogs like me, okay. <laughs> and uh, there were three different times when I was at the funeral home, where there was a stray dog guarding the back stairs. It wouldn't let me approach. It wouldn't let me do anything. Three times to the same stairs. Different mm. dog each time? Different dog each time. And they were guarding it aggressively. And so I had to cow the pound all three times to come get the dog. Oh, that's really fascinating. So it's... It, it's it's a crazy world out there, folks. I mean, mm -hmm. you you hear of, uh, you know, like uh, canine handlers in the service. If mm -hmm. they're killed in in uh, the line of duty and the dog won't leave the grave yeah. once they're, they're, they're buried, you know, animals have a, a, a connection, definitely. Mm -hmm. so, but do you think in those cases the dogs were so shapeshifters or do the, you think... The first time, I thought it was weird. And it okay. was a big, gnarly Rottweiler. Mm. And I thought, so ah. it could be a little scary. It was, mm -hmm. it was scary. The next two times, I thought, this is becoming a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I asked the folks, and none of them seemed to know if the deceased person had that type of dog or had been around it or even liked dogs. It, it just seemed to be coincidental. Mm. Yeah. But it, it wasn't to me because it was the same set of stairs. And it yeah. was, it was the, the door we had to go into to turn off the alarm. There wasn't hmm. really another option. So it, 
Well, it's right. also interesting that the dog would be right there at that specific door. Exactly. Yeah. So, do I think it was a shape sifter? I have convinced myself that it was not. But, <laughs> but there was some connection. There's a connection right. <laughs> yeah. It may not be a shape shifter, but some connection. So, so what, are, what are your thoughts? Um, is this real? Is it real? Was it real and it's no longer real? Be, or is it, was it never real? So I've been thinking about this one a lot. And I believe that things happen that you give power to. It just happens. And like when I, when I looked at that elder and he gave me that tidbit of wisdom, he gave power to it. Mm -hmm. It was there. And so is that there for you? I don't know. It was there for him. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a, a phenomena that will probably never be proven. But if you believe, you believe. And if you don't, you don't. Yeah. For me, though, um, the different cultures throughout all different parts of time, different parts of the world, and they're all somewhat similar, there's got to be a little bit of truth in there somewhere. Now, where the truth is and where the lore starts, that's kind of where the question is. But there's at least a sliver of truth in there somewhere. That's what I think. I, I, I don't think that, that we can have the same. You can call it different things, but it's the same abilities throughout every continent and all, every culture for thousands of years. I don't know that unless everything that we read is completely fictional. You know what I'm saying? Because. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I've had too many weird things happen to me in my life that. I believe anything is possible. So and shapeshifter believe, wouldn't even bother you then, huh? It's like, I, mean, I, okay. I, I believe <laughs> that if you were in the, whether you call it the right place or the wrong place, at the right or wrong mm -hmm. time, anything is possible. And no, there was no substance. Cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, I, I, I think that there is truth somewhere in all of it, kind of like your explanation over the children. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, and I don't know how you could have a complete culture that is afraid to talk about it if things did not happen. Mm -hmm. And that's an entire, not just, I'm talking here and Navajos, all of them, it don't matter. They all don't want to talk about it. That's the other thing. If it was just a story or a lore, people will talk about it. Um, the fact that people are hesitant to talk about it means that there's something there. Usually something behind that. And normally it's dark. <laughs> and if you knew, you wouldn't ask. Yeah, I know. <laughs> go. In all of the reading that I've done, I haven't seen too many shapeshifters that are good. Yeah. There's very, there's, very few. Right. Very few. They're they're used they're, yeah. to instill fear in somebody or control over somebody or you know revenge yeah mm -hmm. yeah so yeah no the vast majority of them are, are very negative um or at least tied to negative experiences or what is associated as a negative experience um there's a lot of people who believe that the the bigfoot entity is a shapeshifter and because it will be there one second, the next second it's gone. I don't know if I believe that Bigfoot's a shapeshifter, but uh, that theory is out there. So that's one where it may or may not necessarily be a negative thing, but it's, you know, something was here and now it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so, and something usually fairly large, too, that's kind of hard to miss. Well, and it boils down to experiences. I think I've use this example in every podcast but <laughs> I have some property up yonder uh, kind of my lab of hot springs Fish Creek Good. and I really really like it a lot I know it really well it's kind of my happy place and one day it was absolutely quiet which is remarkable for the outdoors 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely remarkable. And I just felt something watching me. Whatever it was. And so I took my gun out, and I shot, and all of a sudden, all the noises started happening again. And it was fine, and I wasn't being watched anymore. And I like to tell myself that it was a cougar. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. We'll go with that. Yeah. I, and so when you, when I think back to that experience that I've mentioned a couple times before. It was a liger. Yeah, that's what it was. Come on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been. Mm -hmm. Could have been. <laughs> that's, that's... Hey, I lived in Soda Springs when that happened. It could have been. <laughs> <laughs> There's... Yeah. There's possibilities, yes. <laughs> but it's the feeling and the negative feeling. And when you're in an instance like that where you have that negative feeling, you don't want your kids to feel it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's easy for me to put in my head uh, Skinwalker or Sam Squatch mm -hmm. named Daryl. Or, or whatever, <laughs> just to try to keep kids safe. You know, when you're talking about a mountain lion or cougar or whatever, when I was cutting trees over in Montana, we had one watching us. And, but you, even when your chainsaw was up, the birds were still, yeah. the birds mm -hmm. were still squawking. I mean, there was still outside sound mm -hmm. of nature. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about the complete silence, I don't think it was a cat. So to circle it all around... I don't, do you think it matters if it's a, a different thing, a Sasquatch or a, a shapeshifter? Are we all just trying to get away from that feeling? Possible. Good question. Good question. I asked the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> Deep thoughts was... with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, uh, Part of me really wants to ex experience the thing on the reservation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I, this is what I do, you know. I'm not I'm not the person that runs from the sounds and the ghosts and the knocks in the night. I'm the one that runs to it, right? Because I want to interact with it. I want to know who it is and what it is. Um, the other part of me is like, be careful what you wish for, because, you know, you never invite things into your life that you have no control over, mm -hmm. people included. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying. Okay, I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> so anyway. That, that's a totally different podcast. Okay. We'll come back. We'll, we'll come back to that topic. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I, you just oh, don't funny. invite. You don't invite. Yeah. Um, or be careful what you invite because uh, it may not go as you think. Think. Plan. Yes. We have all of these things about how we can control our destiny and our fate. And, you know, you throw in something like uh, any kind of shapeshifter out there, any any of these legends, and then all of a sudden everything's chaos in your life. And it's, like, it's because you gave it power. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess. I don't know. I know. So. Maybe that's why I never feel rattled on an investigation is because I don't give anything power over me. I don't know, but we had that one event, Mark. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, it was pretty out of control. Mm -hmm. It was an investigation where something was very, very dark. Very dark. And it was really out of control. And I was physically attacked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, thankfully... The person that was working with us that night was a, um, um, he had, was a monk one time. And so he and Mark and a few other people who were there were peeling this thing off of me. That, that was very, and this is me saying it was a dark entity. And I, it's, I'm the one that's always saying it's not a demon. Right. I'm usually the one saying, no, no, that's not nearly as bad as people are making it sound. I'm saying this thing was was a nasty. Yeah. So if and I'm it, saying it, it was, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, and it's not one of those things. You, you get involved in something like this, you know, people call us and we'll go out and we investigate. And we work with the family a few times, and I know they're still plagued by this thing. You cannot walk Ooh. in, huh? They still got that? Uh-huh. You cannot walk in the door and tell somebody you'll make it all better. Mm-hmm. Because we, we don't know if we can. We can walk in and we can interact 
and we can maybe find out information and we can maybe give them some comfort because maybe we do connect with it and we can figure out what who it is because usually it's a person it's a dead person this was not a person this and has been around for a long, long time. time long time and uh and it did morph, and it did change, and it was shape shifting. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say, if, and, and these if were if you could physically feel it. Oh, that that but that's yeah. what I mean is it, mm -hmm. it that that's a whole different thing than what seeing somebody who's kind of stuck or struggling or just happy to be hanging out that you're. I mean, like at the gun plant or yeah. a, that, mm -hmm. two totally different things. If you yeah, can actually physically, was... like they're. Oh yeah, it was very uh very negative and and that's unfortunate and and these these people were native american they were yeah and two it, different tribes mm -hmm. not local do they live on the reservation no close they were right on the edge of it right on the edge well that brings up the question at the time did you think it could be a skinwalker for lack of a better no, word no i don't think we ever mm -hmm. went that way with it no day. we never went into skinwalker but there was some very I mean, there were some very unique things that happened on that specific yeah. investigation. Um, we recorded some really strange sounds, um, canine type sounds. And the and the remember the bat against the tree trunk. Mm -hmm. Ow. It sounded like somebody was literally beating a tree trunk with a baseball bat. Pow! I mean. It would just reverberate it in the house. Mm -hmm. Pow! And it would go on and on and on. And when you walked outside, one of the things um, in <laughs> lore, right, is that you, if you have a willow tree on your property, you knot it. Mm -hmm. And that tree was full of knots. You knot the willow branches. And as the tree grows, the knots grow, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And that tree was knotted. And it was not a decades ago because mm -hmm. the knots were very, very high. So whoever lived on this property was also plagued with stuff. So you think it's the property, not the family? No, both. I think it's a, it was a uh, perfect storm of people and abilities and property. And we kind of plotted a line between some of our other cases. Oh. And we went, oh, wow. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty... Hmm. And they're still, they're still having issues. Do you have specific people that have certain abilities right next to, on land that had something on there anyway, mm -hmm. and everything just lining up? I just got goosebumps because, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, maybe that's why uh, Native Americans don't talk about it, because there is no line to define what it is. It's just that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and the other thing is entities don't really care about property rights either. Yes. No. They're kind of, you know, wherever they need to be, they'll go there. So, Yeah, it is, it, it is interesting when you get involved in this kind of work and you, and you work with people long enough, you run into non-human entities. I mean, they're mm -hmm. there. And it doesn't mean they're all negative. But just the fact that they're there creates chaos. And... Uh, negativity with the families they may the, the entity itself may not be driving it but right. the energy that it's shooting but, out is causing illnesses and just everything that goes along with it well the energy it shoots, it shoots out puts everybody on edge too yeah so there's always and, fighting yeah. there's always illnesses chronic illnesses with the people involved agitation, with these things constant yeah agitation. because you get anxiety and depression and everything that comes with it so, yeah, everybody's on edge all the time. And so, you know, you say something and that triggers somebody and then people are screaming and yeah. it just kind of goes from there. So. Yeah. So interesting topic. I think the shape-shifting thing is, is fascinating. I wish that uh, our Native American friends would open up a little bit more, but I understand their hesitancy. I truly do. Because yeah, because I have several of them and they won't talk about it. They won't mm -hmm. talk about it at all. And again, it could be from the, the whole line logic of the village movie where you don't talk about it because um, it gives it power or you don't talk about it because of control. You know, mm -hmm. you use it as a control mechanism. I don't right. know. We don't know. 
or we can't handle the truth. And you can't handle the truth. Yeah. <laughs> well, that could be part of it, too, is that even if we told you, you wouldn't believe it. So we're not going to have this conversation. Yeah, we're just not even going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating stuff. Because it is paranormal, beyond normal, so far outside of the normal, that even if we told you about it, you're probably not going to believe it unless you experience it. Yeah. And we all have those friends that think mm -hmm. we're crazy for what we do, right? And they, and they don't even acknowledge if we even slip it into a conversation. They don't acknowledge it. It's, <laughs> it's, she didn't say that crazy thing again, right? Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so just, just keep walking. Just Smile keep, and yeah. nod. Keep <laughs> but people fear what they don't understand, and that's a fact. Yeah. Right. And... Well, and they're probably scared to give it power, too. Well, if, if they acknowledge it, then they have to ex not accept it, but they have to address it. Right? Well, there there are a few entities that if you name them, you get their attention. Yes. And then they start looking at you. And so if they think it could be something like that, then, yeah, you don't even want to talk about it. Because yeah. if you're talking about it, then all of a sudden this thing is watching you. And paying attention to you, and it may consider that an invitation. I have to say that my ex-husband would never... <laughs> oh, God. I watch every dark, creepy movie I can find. Because right? I, <laughs> I love man. I'm sitting out there alone in my house with nothing around me, and mm -hmm. and uh, I all watch something dark, and he's like, you're just going to make it happen. I'm like, oh, my God. I, it's not going to happen because I'm watching The Exorcist, okay? It's just not. <laughs> So, yeah. quick story we're in a, mo a movie theater watching a movie I can't even remember which one it was but uh, there was a scene in there where the professor who was helping them figure out what was going on reached up onto his bookshelf and grabbed a book called the uh, Dictionary of Demons and sitting here in this movie theater watching the movie and I said oh hey I've got that book and you can hear people scooch away <laughs> <laughs> you, you lost your friend yeah but, <laughs> you could just hear this rustling in the movie theater as everybody was scooching away nice oh that's funny <laughs> shapeshifters they've been throughout history they've been through different cultures they've been all around us probably all around us still today if we know where to look for them uh, but that's kind of what we got uh, there's enough in here there's enough lore enough different cultures throughout all points of history there's probably a little bit of truth to what we're talking about. Thank you for joining us today on Talking to Spirits. Speaking of spirits. Speaking of spirits. <laughs> I'll edit that out. What can I tell you? Santa took all the good elves. <laughs> <laughs>